Full Service Radio is proudly supported and hosted by Simplecast, the easiest way for a podcast creator to publish and distribute audio on the internet. For more information, visit Simplecast.com. Full Service Radio. Peace, everyone, and welcome to the Edible Activist Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa L. Jones, broadcasting live from the lobby of The Line, D.C. This podcast is where dynamic people of color in the food and agriculture space share their personal food journeys, passions, and perspectives that stem from the land, all exemplifying the spirit of activism in their own edible way. Let's get started. Peace, everyone, and happy Wednesday. Welcome to the Edible Activist Podcast. So today on the show, I have a really awesome guest. Yes, and all my guests are awesome. So if you hear me say that all the time, it's because they are awesome. So I have Xavier Brown, everyone, who is the founder of Soyful, and he is a native of Washington, D.C., and also a North Carolina A&T University graduate. I have to put it, put that out there because all Aggie graduates are like die hard. Um, so shout out to, to North Carolina A&T. He operates at Boundaries of Urban Agriculture, Environmental Sustainability, and African diasporic culture. His work intertwines sustainability with the issues that impact stressed communities from gun violence to mass incarceration. By studying practices um, of indigenous people and going back to ancestral knowledge, Xavier is creating a new sustainability movement that is healing the people and the land by reconnecting our sacred relationship to the earth. Peace, Xavier. Hey, good morning. Peace, peace. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Finally. How many times did we attempt this? Oh, man. Many, many times. Many times. (laughs) He's a busy man, and I just appreciate you being in my space. Um, Xavier is no stranger to my platform. He is no stranger to my network. He is no stranger to to many of you all, actually, here in the D.C. area and beyond. So thank you again for being on the show. And as many, most of you may know, or some of you may know, um, again, I I mentioned that Xavier is the founder of the wonderful Soyful platform, which he's going to share more with you about. He's also the wonderful creator of the Pippin Sauce. (laughs) So in this episode, um, it's actually, this is going to be a a pretty special episode because yes, for those who do not know Xavier, you're going to get to learn a little bit more about him. That really doesn't change with my shows, guys, as we try to learn just a, a little bit about each of my guests um, who I have on the show. But um, in in honor of Black History Month, in which I like to say Black History is every day, so I'm just not honoring it February. It's every day, okay? But definitely want to take some time out um, during my show to, um, we're going to honor Horace Pippin. And so Xavier is going to tell you, tell you his story, but definitely a black figure in the agriculture space who we want to spotlight. And we're going to, we're going to pull two and two together and, and you're going to see why we're going to honor, um, Horace Pippin, um, hence Pippin sauce. So Xavier, are you ready for us? I'm ready. Who is Xavier? I know who you are. But there's some folks who don't know who Xavier is, so tell us, because there's a lot to who you are. Sure. Uh, Xavier's just a a humble soul, native Washingtonian, um, definitely A&T graduate, no question. (laughs) Um, You know, I guess I'm I'm creative and I'm I'm a connector. I I move around a lot and I meet a lot of people and I like to make connections and I'm into working with the land and the soil and I'm into you know, moving things forward as far as like, you know, black liberation and and and, and uh, just helping black people definitely in this country and worldwide. So I think that's that's who Xavier is. Yeah. Keep it short. Well, how did you move into how did you get into the farming and gardening space? Yeah. So um, it's a long story, but I'm going to keep it short. I'm going to make it short. Uh, so I guess maybe like eight seven or eight years ago i was living in north carolina i uh, I just lost my job the little job i had at that time 
So I had to move back home with my folks. I, you know, a lot was going on. I was trying to figure out the direction that I wanted my life to go into. And um, at that time, I, my father was taking this DC Master Gardener class, and you know, I, I was just hanging out, you know, with the homies, going to the go go and shooting dice and just doing whatever, going to the club. So my dad was was um, starting this, D, taking this DC Master Gardening class while simultaneously my homeboy Ronnie, who I went to high school with and undergrad with at A&T, he was, he was hitting me up and saying he's starting a nonprofit, just trying to figure it out, and, you know, asked me if I wanted to, you know, be a part of it. And I didn't really have anything going on, so I was like, hey, sure. And so we did that. Uh, I joined that, and, and, and one day my dad woke me up Early in the morning, I had, like, gone to the go-go seat backyard or something the day before, and I had a hangover, and he was like, man, you know, plant these trees. Ooh. So we went somewhere, somewhere in, like, northeast, I think in Brooklyn, in, like, Catholic University, like, the Brooklyn area, and there was, um, it was just, like, me and my dad, and, like, a, it was all white people, was no black people, you know, planting trees, and it really, um, I don't know, that, that like, struck me in a, in a certain type of way and I felt like you know we should black people native Washingtonians when I grew up in DC it's chocolate city all black people we should be out here planting trees too it's our neighborhood you know so uh somehow I didn't have any money my father ended up you know paying for me to take the DC master gardener class you know so I give thanks to him green scheme started you know we were trying to figure out what we were doing, doing with that and I just, I just, you know, the gardening and, and, and all that type of stuff just got into me, really. I didn't really get into it. It, it found me, and it's been like a, um, just a, a spirit, I guess, that I've been following ever since then. I, you know, I interned at Eco City Farm, interned, just went to all these different places. Still the same way I am now. Wherever I could kind of find knowledge and learn from people and, and grow and experience new things, I try to take advantage of it. And so that's how I just ended up moving around. I met, you know, I met Blaine, I met Aaliyah, I met Denzel, Mahisha, um, like this is like way back in the day. Um, uh, so many, uh, Sasha from up Baltimore, um, Ross McKay, Eugene, like Karen Washington, so a whole bunch of people, you know. Um, and can I pause for a bit? For sure. So all of these names that Xavier, who Xavier is shouting out, all folks that he has connected me to. And I actually have to say that because once I, when I started this all, um, even before the podcast, when I started Food Talks, even before it was Food Talks, it was Good Soil Events, Xavier was my main point of contact who put me at proximity to all of these great black folks in food and farming. Like he sent, I can't even, Xavier, how many emails? Did, I mean, real talk. I feel like you are the one who, re, like, you talk about con, food as a connector. You really connected me with so many people. Yeah. And I'm sorry if it makes you uncomfortable to get this spotlight, but you did. You really did. And I was just like, I, when I knew that I was navigating in this space of, of storytelling and I wanted to focus on black and brown people. Xavier was like, bet, I know this person, I know that person. Even when I went to Detroit for the first time, he hooked me up with everybody. And I just say thank you. Uh, no problem, yeah. Um, and there's still more people. I don't know there's if you've so gotten down to Atlanta yet. There's a, a I'm supposed of, to be going in a few weeks a for gang, work. <laughs> gang, gang of people down in Atlanta, like I can, at least four or five people I'm thinking of off the top of my head. So in Atlanta, and then, and then you know, they can connect you to more people. And it's just a... Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's like a circle that keeps Absolutely. Going. So, so yeah. since you got into all of this, do you feel that there's been a resurgence of black farmers? Um, certainly, definitely. I think, like, oh, also, oh, I want to mention Gail and Zachary, too. They were two people that I met early on that definitely really inspired me. Zachary, Zachary Curtis and yes. Gail Taylor. Um, yes, and and I think like when I first got into it, I was just doing it because it made my spirit feel good, and I wasn't really doing too much. I wasn't doing, not, I was just, I was trying to figure it out, and so I think so. So I got into it not because I like to farm. I got into it because I, I saw that kind of the early early work that we were doing with the green scheme. I think with the green scheme we were like. I don't want to say innovators, but we were doing something different because nobody was really going into like the hood, hood of DC, like 
doing gardens, you know, doing go go's, like you know what I mean. So it was like very different, and it was a way that we were like, I felt like we were like impacting our community. So um, and then it just so happened that in other places around the country, other people were doing it, but it wasn't like we didn't. We you know we just I was just doing it, speaking for myself, just doing it because it made me feel good. Now I'm realizing like, oh man, like we are part of some. Uh, historical type shit. Yes, you know what I'm saying? exactly, so, <laughs> so, exactly. It's just funny. So it's uh, it's you know um, just a part of something that's bigger than us. Yes, and really kind of getting you know people are you know back then we didn't know about like Leah Penniman up in New York yeah. or you know um, I didn't know about so many people. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Folks, that, I, they everybody at the same Malika time. Kenny you can't, I didn't know and, about none yeah, of that. You know, yeah. so people were doing work. And when I really got into it, I started reading. Reading is like, oh damn, there's people in New Felicia Orleans, Felicia Bell, stuff. and Mississippi. So many and- people. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely. I think it's a, it's a, a, a beautiful movement, and it's like a, a I think a social movement building, and and I think it's a way to like reevaluate just our um, our existence as like black people in the country as like human beings on so many levels. Because for me, urban agriculture. Which well, is agriculture in general has been like a, a teacher to me because I've been able to meet so many brilliant people who have taught me so many things that I didn't, I would not have probably learned. You know, so I've been in conversations with about so many things. You know, so it, I think it's a, it's a it's an amazing movement that we're a part of, and I, I hopefully more people get into it and understand it, and and we were able to be you know cr- you know really be creative. On, on so many different la- levels and really bring our full selves to the table mm-hmm. when, we, when we're in these spaces and we're creating uh, spaces for ourselves and defining ourselves and all that type of stuff. So. Absolutely. And that leads me to, to ask you that I feel like, I shouldn't even start this off with I feel like, I mean, I know, but when I have conversations with white people about farming and agriculture. And I had a conversation recently um, about the work that I do. And it was a positive conversation, let me just say that. I feel like there is a misunderstanding sometimes of why we farm Mm -hmm. and garden. And it's uh, some of the times it's not just because we want a cucumber popping up in our backyard. But it's something a lot more deeper than that. Do you feel like there is a disconnection as into why it the importance of why we farm? Uh, yeah. Versus. I, I, I'm not bad, I mean to <laughs> no, 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 no. You're you're yeah. totally fine. Yeah, I think because um... I feel I'm you and what I'll say to be fair, I'm I. I don't know if I knew this 100%, but now that I'm having more of these conversations as I'm getting deeper into my work, I mean, I even learned. Like, so that's something that I learned. When I started all of this, mm-hmm. like, it was something totally different. And yeah. it's expanding because I'm learning from folks like you um, and, and everybody else in the food space. And I was like, damn, it's deeper yeah, than no, just a garden bed and <laughs> planting, you know, some like it's really deeper. It's it's very it's spiritual work and you know, a lot of the work that you all are you all are doing is work that our ancestors did and there's just so many layers to it and now I'm starting to pick up at when I have conversations with my some of my white friends, I don't know that they get really why we and when I say we I'm I'm representing us because I'm not in the farm okay <laughs> I need to be but I I do feel like there that there is a disconnect and before you answer that for those who just tuned in this is Melissa L. Jones um, broadcasting live from um, from the lobby of the line DC the edible act of a uh, edible activist podcast and i have xavier brown of soyful with me today and we are doing two things today we're learning about xavier for those who don't know him i know him but some of you guys don't and we're also honoring the work of horace pippen um who we're actually going to tell you more about later on in the show but um just want to shout those out and for those who've been listening thank you thank you for tuning in so 
do you feel that there is a disconnect? Uh, I'm not just yeah, certainly. And I think, um, and I think we're in such a, uh, a, a beautiful and pivotal time because there's so much like intellectual material coming out on like the black experience around land and food. You know, like I just posted on my IG and Facebook a few days ago, like all the, these different books. Like, and most of them have come out like re- like last two three years. Like uh, Monica White's book just came out called Freedom Farms. Yes, it's a dope book. I can't book. wait to get you that. Got, uh, you know how fr- many books I got saved <laughs> in my list? It don't make no. It's it's kind of ridiculous. You know, it's like a hundred. You got Farm and Wild Black that just came yes. out early this year. Shout you out got uh, um, there's a woman. You should interview. Her name is Ashanti Reed. She did she did a study on on food systems in DC, particularly particularly in Ward Seven and D. Oh wow! Okay, and, and it was like on the early work that Greenskin was doing. So um, and it's the other books, but it's a lot of intellectual material. It's a book that um, that Aaliyah, Shakira, Trina, Blaine, Leah Penn, all of them they were they contributed, mm-hmm. and I can't think of the name of it. It's another book called Color of Food that came out like a few years ago. Oh, Natasha Bond. Yeah, right. it's, I'm it's, actually going to read it for the second time. It's a I lot like of it. a lot of information going in, and like um, having us really like define ourselves and our history and our story, and really yes. ev- evalu- reevaluating. Um, that experience. There's a lot of different uh, convenings and retreats going on. So really, I think the time for us to speak, you know, for ourselves and also, you know, really kind of reclaim that history of our ancestors who worked the soil, worked the land, Mm -hmm. who did all these types of things and really reclaiming it. But also, I think it's it's like these um, these spaces where people can also be free. Because in a lot of times, you know, when you live in your day to day life in D.C., Philly, Detroit, wherever you are, you know, you not you can't really be free how you want to be free. And so when you out like at a BDFC Afroecology encounter, you can be free to, you know, whoever you are, you know, whatever spirit you have, you can like be there. So I think it's right. very deep. And I think a lot of we're a lot of we, we are all reclaiming that knowledge. Right. Yeah. We're going back and getting it Sankofa style. But we're also p- pushing it forward. Absolutely. You feel what I'm saying? So I when you read you. like um, um, Monica White's book is dope because she talks a lot. Of, she she talks about you know Booker T. Washington, George Washington yes. Carver, um, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, right? Yes. Fannie Lou Hamer, who's, yes. who's amazing. She's amazing. Um, uh, Federation of Southern Cooperatives, the Bolivar Cooperative, and these are like in Mississippi, and then um, Detroit Black Food Security Network. Mm-hmm. But all these different things like like Fannie Lou Hamer, Booker T. Washington, Carver. You know, WB Du Bois, like these people, like the stuff we're doing now, they had already kind of, they were doing it and envisioned Absolutely. it. Like this is like over 100 years ago, I guess, at this point, or close to 100 years ago. You can check me on my time. But um, like, so we're like really like picking up where they left off. So it's a lot of like things that, that we're really digging up yeah. and, and taking forward. When you think about the co-op that they started in Detroit Stuff that's going Ooh, on I can't wait for in, that. in D.C. with food hubs and really figuring out, like, how can we create a food system that is for us on our terms, um, you know, it's anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchy, mm-hmm. and all these, you know, really, really kind of moving things forward. And, and I think it's really picking up the struggle that black people have always done in this country. We've always, like, moved things forward. Mm-hmm. We've always been the ones, like, pushing the thing, pushing America, holding America accountable mm-hmm. to be what... You know, America says they are. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, um, so of course, it's very deep. It's about you know, sea sovereignty and land sovereignty, and so many different things. I don't want to take up too much time. Just like no, <laughs> I'm over here feeling every word, and y'all can see this is why Xavier was who I tapped when I started this all because I was like, you have all the knowledge, okay? You got the juice. No, I it just it just gives me chills because you know, in as I walk in this path it just sometimes I don't know if you question yourself or or do you ever say you know like would my ancestor like our ancestors proud of what we're doing right now Mm -hmm. and I started to think about that a lot like a lot that's been on my mind like damn like are they I know that they are because I'm like we're really doing the work and when I think about it it's just so exciting and it's so powerful, and um, I don't know. I just, I just feel empowered, you know. Even when I, even when they're just, you can look at the news, and, you, and even when there are moments of like, damn, like we're just still oppressed, and it's just still a lot. But we, it's slow moving, but we're pushing. 
we're pushing. And so I, I had to ask that question because I did have a conversation not too long ago. And sometimes I have to watch what I say, you know, because I'm still learning too. And I, and I wanted to question this person. I was just, and I wanted to say, like, do you really understand why black people farm? You know, like why they're in this space? Like, do you? I don't know that you do. And again, it wasn't a, a, a I, didn't, I didn't want it to seem like that person was ignorant, but I just, it's just, it's a, it's a learning experience. So, um, for some folks. So you mentioned Afroecology and you mentioned really defining, defining the space that we're in. And you are part of what you all call the Dirt Collective, which is, is, is a collective that makes up of um, black and brown um, activists and farmers and gardeners and those in the space of social justice and really defining our space here in, in and on the land. And so you were part of defining Afroecology, which was a word that I just learned maybe over a year ago and maybe a year and a half ago. And I remember like saying to myself, like, I've never heard this before. I think I was trying to look it up and I just really didn't understand it. Again, it was me learning. But talk to us a bit about Afroecology, yeah, and how you all define that. Certainly. So, um, well, I think like you know, Aaliyah, Blaine, Shakira, Trina. There's a woman named Tracy that you should ch- talk with if you haven't met her. She's in D.C. Okay. She, she went to A and T, but she has a lot of knowledge. She has um, an organization around Black land. So it's a whole bunch of other people that that like poured their intellect and their spirits into it. I guess can I read the definition? Yes. Real fast? Yes. So, like, just the quick definition of Afroecology is is that a form of art, movement, practice, and process of social and ecological transformation that involves the re-evaluation of our sacred relationships with land, water, air, seed, and food. We recognize as humans as co-creators that are an aspect of the planet's life support system. Values the Afro-Indigenous experience of reality and ways of knowing. Visualizes the importance of women and feminine energies as vital to our collective liberation. Cherishes ancestral communal forms of knowledge, experiences, and life, life ways that began in Africa and continue through the diaspora, and is rooted in the agrarian traditions, legacies, and struggles of the Black experience in the Americas. And so, I think um, back, man, it's, it's kind of so. This is like some years ago. I think when we were uh, like trying to figure things out, like you know, BDFC, you know, uh, we came together. We used to have these. Uh, these gatherings, I guess we call them retreats, out in the eastern shore of Maryland. It was like this big house that they had, and, and, and we used to all come and, and, and learn from each other and really, like, trying to define, you know, ourselves. And at the time, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a full grasp of, like, what we were doing. I was just doing it because, like, you know, my friends, we here together. It's fun. Everybody's in one big house. It's like, it's like it's everybody in one big house. It's yeah. summer camp. It's, like, it's fun, you know? But it was very political and, 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 and spiritual and, and enlightening all at the same time. And I think um, every black farmer and food person that you've met is like embodies Afroecology. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's a definition, but it's also like we, we embody it. Soil food, pip and sauce is a part of Afroecology. It's about seed keeping. It's about keeping culture and stories alive. You know, um, what... Uh, the folks in, in Detroit are doing what Shakira is doing yes. is Afroecology. Her research, what Leah Penham is doing up in mm-hmm. up in New York is Afroecology. What you know Trina's doing in Philly is Afroecology. What Aaliyah is doing, you know, in Maryland, all over in Trinidad, you know, with the coffee, with everything she's doing, with Blaine. So we like embody Afroecology. You you know what you're doing, keeping stories alive. You know, becoming like a griot and really telling these stories because in, you know, once we're ancestors in like sixty years the people that are our age in 60 years will have some type of technology where they're going back and listening to what you're saying. You know what I mean? So we're really, I think that's all part of Afroecology. So, so we embody it. We has, we have these, these retreats, these gatherings, all black for black farmers only gatherings. The first one we had was on the Eastern shore of Maryland. It was beautiful. It was, it was crazy. Right. The second one we had was uh, down in Durham at the homie Taz. You should check this guy, dude named Taz. He's in Durham. She really. You see, Xavier. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's, he's part of BDFC too. He's a real good dude. You should check him out. He has a lot of knowledge. Mate's just a beautiful dude, right? But he has they he got some land down there and land sovereignty, and getting access to land 
is a part of Afroecology, is a part of food sovereignty. So he has land down there. So we were down there. This is like two years ago at this point, 2017. It was beautiful. That's probably the best one we did. We had like this fireside women's uh, circle. It was those like it was at night, right? It was a, a fire, and they were you couldn't really see anything because it was dark. I mean, like in the middle of the woods, and, and, and it was just this it's fire, circle, you know, of fire. but you could just hear, you know what I mean? So it was um, uh, uh, Ben Burkett's daughter, I can't remember everybody's name, but it was beautiful. And the people who were there, you know, um, I'm just envisioning, you know, it right we now. had you know, drum circle, it, it was real beautiful. That was probably the best one we got to, you know, learn about, you know, what it means to go through together, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like what that means when, when you know, for solidarity purposes, um, BDFC, we are connected with uh, farmers in Puerto Rico through, uh, you know, agroecology yeah. and, and, and that um, political and agricultural uh, ecological process. And so last year we went over there after Maria and, and mm-hmm. we worked on some farms and, and camped and really, you know, built solidarity with one another. Um, a group of us went the year before for agri- me, Joel, and uh, Shakira went up there for, for an encounter and really, you know, built with the farmers in, in, in Puerto Rico yeah, and, and their, um, you know, movement for like independence and, and land sovereignty and, and regaining their ancestral roots around food. So it's, it's connected deep. And there's so many people I feel like that are connected to Afroecology, even if they don't articulate it that way. Right. That's the way I see it. And I think um, Afroecology is definitely going to be something that maybe one day like, uh, you know, because Black Dirt Farm is it's not just, it's like academics, it's scientists, like Aaliyah is like a scientist, mm-hmm. you know, farmer. I'm like a community organizer, farmer. Shakir is like an academic, Shade mm-hmm. is an academic. So maybe somebody will write a book on Afroecology and how it manifests itself in D.C., Philly, in Trinidad, and Barbados. Let's and not say maybe, whatever. let's do it. You know, and so. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. And I definitely want to push, that's important, and I definitely want to push that Afroecology out more and I want to make it intentional that I use that in my conversations and how you know um, we're all defining the work that we do and I think that's I think it's really important and I stress importance on that because I realize that there's language that I do want to take out of my conversations which I've already kind of started to do but if you hear me say it forgive me but you know um I mean I just toss words out there like I try not to use urban agriculture anymore you know I try not to use I don't know there are a few other terms that I try not to use um because of they were what they're associated with, you know, and when I when I got into this space, one of the reasons why I did is because when I thought of agriculture, I thought of white agriculture. And then when we started using the term urban agriculture, you know, I realized that it was more so geared to um, the white farmers who were coming in urban spaces, calling it urban agriculture. And, you know, I could say sorry, not sorry, but, um, you know, I definitely want to use the language that really defines what we all do. And I think that is important for the context of our conversations and, um, again, to define our space. So that's big. So I hope I definitely hope that there is some type of um book or something i think that's really dope that needs to happen yeah and i really want to use that term some more i I really do and i think we're gonna uh i want to have a uh an encounter at least one this year like an afroecology encounter this year and do it again and i think since like uh we we took a break off in 2018 took a break off Mm -hmm. you know it was a busy year long year um so come back in 2019 and host an encounter and so um i think we're gonna meet soon and organize that and what it would look like and um, figure out ways that we can raise, um, you know, money to uh, make it happen. But I'm pretty sure it's going to go down. So I'm looking forward to, um, you know, making that happen. Hopefully you can come out. It's dope. Yes. We, we, we camp. If you have, you know, everybody brings out a tent. We camp. Everything is communal. Um, you know. Now, I'm going to need help setting up the tent. You got people that can do that. I, I want to just make, I, listen, I'm just, I, I like the outdoors now. <laughs> I'm going to keep it really real with you. I love the outdoors. And I I think the last time I went camping, it wasn't even really camping, honestly, because I was in a cabin. It's definitely going to be camping. Like, um, but no, la- yeah. I definitely want to do it. 
And um, I just know I'm going to need some extra resources and yeah. some extra help and um, just make sure my, my tent is a little bit insulated. No, that's the, I would say <laughs> one thing that I think we all learned from being in, in, in Puerto Rico that time, last time, was uh, get it. Don't go to Walmart and get your tent. Oh, okay. Treat yourself. Go to REI. Go to REI. <laughs> Don't do the Walmart. Try, cause it, was, it was raining. We were on top of a mountain. It was raining like oh, no, crazy. Everybody's no. tent, except for my tent. I was dry. <laughs> Everybody else, all the other bands, they got them cheap tents. They was wet. They socks was wet. Everything was wet. Real, man. <laughs> all day was just like raining all night. It was wet. It was muddy. We all put our tents Hell at the no. bottom of a hill. So water, it was crazy. But it was a good time. Um, and, you know, we built like, I feel like a tighter bond. You yeah. know what I mean? Cause everybody, except for me, was wet. And, and um, you know, <laughs> So get a good that tent. That is like, hilarious. If you don't do anything, get I a good would tent. love to be a part of that encounter, and I'm yeah. going to be the first to tell you it would be a first experience for me. But um, just because you know, it's it's camping, it's outdoors, but it's it's I want to connect more. And what makes Melissa happy is being outdoors, placing my feet on some good soil, hugging a tree, looking at an herb. And really, I just want i want to connect more with my ancestors. I do. I really, really do. And again, I hope that they're looking at all of us and just clapping their hands and proud of the work that we're doing. Mm-hmm. I agree. Because I've just Certainly. been questioning that. I was just like, Dag, like, there's a lot of us doing really great work, and I hope they're proud of us. Yeah, yeah, you know. And do that research. I know you said your people's from Mississippi. They are. And you know, that has a deep, just with civil rights and black liberation, mm-hmm. Mississippi is like, you know, the heart of a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of people coming out of Mississippi. So um, I'm sure that they're, they're proud. And, you know, I feel, you know, you can still communicate. You know, when you listen, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's this song by, uh, you ever heard of this group? I just got hip to them. So I don't want to be like, I've been hip. <laughs> I just got hip to them. Being but, honest. <laughs> but this group um, called Sweet Honey on the Rock. You heard oh, Sweet Honey no. Rock? You should check them out. Okay. But they have a song, it's like an ancestral it's a song called um, About Ancestors. And, and it talks like, it's basically, like the lyrics are like, when, when you, you can hear them, you know, in the wind, you can hear them through nature, they're, they're talking to mm-hmm. you if you listen. If you listen. You know what I'm saying? And you can communicate with them. You know what I mean? So um, I think with a lot of that's probably, I, I'm assuming, a, a common thread with a lot of the agrarian, whether mm-hmm. they're. Uh, academics or farmers or whatever they'll probably talk about that you know um listening to the ancestors mm-hmm. you know, and all that and how that's driving them because one day we'll be ancestors and somebody exactly. will be looking at us like man you know melissa you know my auntie melissa my mom melissa my cousin you mm-hmm. know calling out your name and be like man she did had this amazing podcast back in 2019 and interviewed all these people you know and mm-hmm. they'll be wanting to you know so yeah. Yeah. That's going to be dope. That's going to be dope. All right, guys. So Melissa L. Jones here with the Edible Activist podcast broadcasting live from the lo- from the lo- lo- lobby of the line DC. I've been chatting with Xavier Brown of Soyful, having a really deep conversation um, about ancestry and farming and connecting with the land and what this all really means to us and so i'm going to take a really quick break and we'll be right back You're listening to Perfect Day, produced by Artists Authentic. For more of Authentic's work, visit allornothingstudios.com.
Peace, everyone, and welcome back. Um, This is Melissa L. Jones um, with the Edible Activist Podcast, broadcasting live from the line of the line Hotel DC. And I've been chatting with Xavier Brown of Soyful. Um, Really great conversations. Really great conversations. Have you been enjoying yourself, Xavier? Uh, It's been dope. I appreciate you for having me. No, I'm just sitting over here not trying to say amen to every word. I was just sitting here quiet. It was just hard. Um, Thank you for sharing that. For those who are just um, tuning in, um, I've been chatting here with Xavier. Just, you know, he told us a little bit about how he got into farming and gardening um, and a little bit about um, defining the space um, for black and brown people um, in, in, in farming and what this means to us and the land and um, all these really great things. So thank you again for sharing that. And so um, for the second half of the show, as I mentioned earlier, you know, somebody who I really wanted to honor this month um, was Horace Pippen, who we're actually going to, um, Xavier is actually going to tell you Horace um, Pippen's story, but um, Xavier has this wonderful product um, called Pippin Sauce. And if you haven't had it, you need to try it. And so over last summer of 2018, I have to catch myself because you're in 2019, I had the privilege of um, collaborating with Xavier to document some of the stories of um, some black and brown farmers here in the D.C. area who grew peppers for Xavier so that he can create this wonderful product. But there's a story behind the product. And as I sat here and listened to Xavier talked, um, and I thought about history and black history, it's almost like his story of his story. I'm not sure if you like get that, get that, you know, it's like a photo of a photo. And, you know, I think the work that Xavier is doing now is certainly he has certainly been influenced by this amazing um, um, individual, Horace Pippen, who has an incredible story and, you know, has inspired Xavier in so many different ways to create this wonderful product and to not just the product, but to create a system that is supporting um, our farmers and gardeners in, in, in the D.C. area. So, um, Xavier, let's talk about this project that we worked on. Let's talk about Pippin. Tell everybody who Pippin is. Certainly. Um, so I first got introduced to the Horace Pippin kind of pepper in the story back in like 2012. Where I was invited to go to a a seed keepers of color gathering. It's like when I first started getting into the soil and the land work. Seed keepers of color gathering down in like North Carolina. And it was a whole bunch of people. I didn't know... I didn't know anybody. Only people I knew was like Blaine. He invited me. It was like Blaine was there, Kevin Angela, Eugene from down in Atlanta, who you should talk to. Karen Washington was there. Um, I think Owen and Chris, they were, Owen and Chris were definitely there. Cause they were seed people. They seed keepers. Um, and there was some other, maybe Aaliyah, maybe some other people that, that were there. It was like 10 or 12 of us. Um, and, and, and that's when I learned about seed keeping and learned about that particular pepper. Um, like, fast forward, later on that year, um, we all used to, like, go. When I say we, it's like me, Aaliyah, Blaine, Maisha. It was this, this brother who you should talk to. He's in Baltimore named Denzel Mitchell, if you never heard of him before. Mm, he was kind of like, I would say he's like the big homie, right, for all of us. For me personally, because he was, like, the first person to really show first black person I could see that wasn't he's not that much older than us but he made the farm and it looked cool you know he listened to rap music mm-hmm. he had a family he made it look dope mm-hmm. like, oh this is like some cool shit yeah. and so um, he was growing the fish peppers for these dudes over here for this sauce Woodbury Kitchen Sauce that's over oh, here he oh. was growing those peppers because they're, they're based Didn't out of Baltimore did I know that yeah he was growing he was growing those peppers for that sauce back then oh wow he, he was like the first person to really like you know was like oh I'm growing these you know boom so fast forward, you know, I'm connected with Owen. Owen's the seed guy. Everybody knows Owen. But he kind of operates in a certain spaces because he's directly connected with the grandson of the guy who Horace Pippen gave the seeds to. And so, you know, I got some seeds from Owen. I'm doing my regular urban ag thing down at Project Eden in Southeast. Um, I may have bought some seeds from Owen or got them from, from somehow. And uh, I grew a whole bunch of peppers. 
I saved the seeds, grew them out again, and at just this point in time, I just had a whole bunch of just fish pepper. Like they were, they were just booming for me. It was just doing like doing crazy numbers, and I knew I couldn't give away this many. Like nobody's going to just you know grab it unless you really know it's, it's a unless rare. Unless you have a need, yeah, and a need specific for it, need you know. For it, yeah. and, and in the, that particular community, like nobody's just going to buy a whole bunch of like hot peppers. Right. They were like bell peppers, <laughs> maybe, but not these chili peppers. They, they, you know. So I was just like. Uh, you know, just through like the conversations, uh, just how I move everybody, you know, talking mm-hmm. about how can we make money off, you know, farming, turn to a business. So I've talked to plenty of people about making sauces, making jellies, all that type of stuff. So this is just how my life works. So in, in another conversation, I'm speaking with this elder. Um, I, I, well, uh, let's pause. Okay, go ahead. I'm let's sorry. No, no, you're good. So let's tell our um, our listeners who, who Horace Certainly. is. Yeah, so, that so we can. Um, so I, I I read a lot. So um, Horace Pippin is he's a famous. If you would Google his name, he would come up as an African American painter mm-hmm. uh, during like the World War One. I, I guess that's like maybe the Great Depression mm-hmm. era, right? Or, or post World War One, and be turned into a painter. Um, he's an amazing painter. He's kind of world renowned. His stuff is in all the you know galleries downtown in mm-hmm. D.C. So if you were to Google his name, that's what you would come up with. Yes. Um, Horace. Pippin the Sea Keeper, that's just something that he, I guess he did in between time. He's a black dude, probably, family probably migrated from the South. He kept seeds. Um, uh, he, the story goes that he traded, and he, he had kind of already knew the guy H.R. Weaver. They'd already, so there's like the fish pepper seeds, that the horse, he has other, there's other horse Pippin seeds. Right. So there's like right. the Brandon Mulatta's horse Pippin, there's like a couple other mm-hmm. seeds that are, that are, um, Horace Pippen is giving, you know, credit to, mm-hmm. to giving to the guy H.R. Weaver. This particular story about the fish pepper seeds goes that, you know, during World War One, Horace Pippen got shot in his arm. Um, he taught himself how to paint, you know, with one arm. Uh, but there was a remedy, you know, back in those days that uh, bee stings would kind of bring back, help fight arthritis, bring back the feeling in your arm. He went to Weaver. He knew Weaver was a seed keeper, farmer. Had bees, and he was like, you know, I'll trade you these rare seeds for some bee stings. I think, you know, from the story I've told, I've been told, is that Weaver was like, you know, like, like basically like, bro, like, if you know, you stick your hand <laughs> in my, my beehive, you're going to kill all my bees. Mm-hmm. But eventually, I guess he was able to talk him in. They made the deal. Mm-hmm. He traded those seeds. Now, the, the these seeds come to, you know, the Philadelphia, Baltimore, Mid-Atlantic region via the Caribbean through the transatlantic slave trade. So they come mm-hmm. with enslaved Africans. So... That's how they, they come. So they may, I think, either Haiti or like Trinidad, depending on who you ask, right? Mm-hmm. They got the name fish pepper because uh, chefs up in Philly, up in Baltimore, they would make a fish pepper sauce. So different oh, than, than the okay. one that I, I make. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So they would, make a, they would use it to make a fish pepper sauce back in, you know, back in those days. And so they just, they just held that name. He traded those seeds. Of course, you know, Horace Pippen passes away. H.R. Uh, Weaver, you know, they both transition. Um... Uh, Weaver's mm-hmm. grandson, William Roy's Weaver, they're cleaning out his grandfather's uh, like refrigerator seed collection. And he finds these seeds, Pippin fish pepper seeds, and you know finds that collection. Uh, he gives them to you know different folks to kind of grow them out again, and boom, they back on the they're back on the scene. Because like somebody told me, like you can save seeds, but really the only really way to save seeds is if you grow them. See, exactly. they want to be in the ground, you know. So you got to grow them to really keep that, that, exactly. that those genetics alive, keep it going. You know why that story, his story is so dynamic to me and that, again, like you said, if you Google his name, he comes up as a painter. And I remember researching him and that's all that pulled up because I was trying to learn more about, you know, I was like, where did the seed part come in? Like, what is that story pulled in? And I was able to find some information. And I say it's it's dynamic in many ways because it just is. But I was having a conversation the other day um, with a girlfriend of mine who happens to be an artist. So the fact that I can, you know, have this conversation and share Horace's um, his history and say, you do know that he was a painter and then be able to relate that to agriculture and the land and the seeds. I think that's just a really just another way to have conversations with other folks who may not be in you know the food or farming landscape and I thought that was just amazing um, because it's it's a relatable story to many and many people don't some people don't know like when you think of like the farmer or the gardener or you think of someone who's a, a seed keeper you don't think like oh he was an artist too 
you know? And so a lot of this area is full of artists and creatives, full of artists and creatives. So I thought it's just a really dynamic story. So sorry, I had to just pause you there. So you've created this product, Pippin Sauce. Sorry. Well, first you created pip, you created a pepper jelly, which I'm still yeah. waiting for. Uh, yeah. So, so we, you got a few minutes to talk to us about the sauce. Go, that yeah. You've been so we started with the pepper jelly. Um, we started. Just, that was the, that was what I was creating in my, in my my kitchen at home, the pepper jelly, and I was actually gonna call it um, call it the dope jam. <laughs> I was just playing off the backyard song. <laughs> the backyard, yeah. You know what I mean? But I figured a lot of people outside of DC wouldn't, it wouldn't yeah. like, make that connection. They'd be like, you know. They would have. So, yeah. And Go-Go so, is like universal now, yeah, ain't it? Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. But I just didn't know, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, I um, So then, you know, I was like, you know, pepper jelly a lot. When I was giving it out to my friends, anybody that would like take a bottle, I would just give it to them. It was like, oh, it sounds good. I, want, I will eat it on like a biscuit in the morning for breakfast. And I was like, nah, that's not really what I want. You know, I want I something want that's like now. people can really like, it, they would really use on a regular basis. And I figured like sauce is something like people, you know, sauce is like a hot sauce is like a cultural thing. People, mm-hmm. you know, have you Tabasco, know, Tabasco, and, Texas Pete, yeah, whatever, you know, yep. your hot sauce is. And they carry it around in a bag. Beyonce talk about it I bag. Hillary bag, Clinton y'all. was pandering with hot sauce. You know, all types of just hot sauce. So I'm like, don't carry no hot sauce you know in her I mean? bag. She was lying. <laughs> Go ahead. And so uh, I figured, like, just looking at the recipe, I started with a base recipe, and I was, like, just changing it up. Me and my homeboy went for Jones when I went to high school with my good friend. And so we were just, like, changing it up, changing it up. And we figured, realized that if we just, like, changed, like, one or two ingredients, we can make it a sauce. Boom. That's when we wanted to, wanted to kind of honor Horace Pippen and at the same time uh, um, keep it where as though like the label is like a dope label where people like definitely in D.C. because it's rooted in D.C. And I feel like, you know, history is something that's like a living thing. So it's yes. continuing to grow. So it's like yes. now like the story of Horace Pippen's fish pepper seeds includes soil full of clues. Bo and them uh, play terrace includes dreaming out loud mm-hmm. and includes Aaliyah out in Eastern Shore blaming them it includes so many people now. Green scheme. Uh, you know, Samir, so many people. And so now um, it's just like growing now. And so we kind of like, I got my homegirl Casey to design the label in a way that it's like, it tells a story. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the label, you see kind of continental African things, but you also see African American DC centric things. You also th- see things from like BDFC. You might see no culture without agriculture. You see a ton of different yes. things. And so, no um, culture without agriculture. you know, we're kind of really building it out. And, and this year, I think, um, I'll, I'll be able to kind of take it to another level, really get it into stores. Last year, we made more, made like 10 times more bottles uh, 2018 than we did in 2017. So I think um, this year we'll make even more bottles in 2019. You better, because I want to buy all yeah, of them. Yeah, and I really want to incorporate the youth more into the process and make it an a, a educational, um, a, a, a educational kind of um uh, political educational process as far as making a sauce mm-hmm. um, and there's a woman that my folks in Atlanta I'm trying to I need to follow up with a woman named Abia Dune but she has she's doing something very similar with her hot sauce down, down in A mm-hmm. working with um, the youth down there so I want to do something very similar to that up, up in D.C. And, and, and really figure out how we can incorporate the youth into this uh, process of making this sauce, knowing the history, yes. knowing the, you know just the political education, the business, all this type of stuff, and connect them to like the m- different resources that I'm plugged into. Well, I, I, I again, I think it's just I, I think it's wonderful because you know, a you're creating a, a business out of this, and we've had this conversation before, and I have this conversation with other people, like you know this. We're creating a business. We're going to make money, you know, like, which is something that, you know, I feel like some farmers struggle with um, in terms of creating products and being okay with making money. So we have that aspect. And then, like you said, we have the educational aspect. And um, I was again, I really had we had so much fun visiting um trina who's who grew your peppers we went to go see kevin out in capitol heights who grew your peppers um violet you know um out at dreaming out loud at keller miller, keller miller farm who grew the peppers um and actually these are some so coming up this week guys i'm actually going to share the series um of um the the pip and Saul series i guess maybe that's what i guess that's what i'll call it <laughs> So um, this this podcast and this interview is actually going to be a segue into what I'll be sharing this week uh, because I really want to um, keep I want to honor Horace Pippen 
in his work. And we all know the importance of saving seeds. Yes, so that we can grow wonderful um, produce, but it's saving, it's keeping our history alive. So the fact that these seeds are planted, not in just D.C., they're in D.C., they're in Maryland, they're in Virginia, um, they're in, you know, in this region, I think it's just wonderful. And the system that you created, um, Xavier, of giving, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I believe this is how it went down, so you provided the seeds to the farmers and the gardeners, and you, they, grew the, they grew the peppers for you, and then you, they weighed them, or you weighed them, and you paid them, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah, that's, that's kind of close to it. So okay. one, one of my mentors, uh, this woman named Akima Price, sent me an article about some folks in New York the Bronx hot sauce and they were doing something very similar to it and I was like you know I can do that I know a bunch of people in DC that grow peppers and I had saved I had like probably like 10,000 seeds I had a rack of seeds just from like saving them you know not even taking the plants out of the ground just letting them stay there over winter you know Mm -hmm. Um, and so they were just sitting there in the shell just like in a case and so uh, Dr. Amin you know Nazirak he connected me with his farm like in Montgomery County called Sharps Farm, and pretty much like one of their main things that they do is that they start off seedlings for people. He was getting, he grows a lot of rice. He was getting his rice seedlings yes. starting out there. I was like, I, I called them, figured it out, sent them my seeds, and I had the seedlings. And so that's what I did. I just went around the folks, just like, yo, I'm working on this project, and I'll give you, I think when I first started, I was giving about $5 per pound, which, you know, all, you know, the, my, some of the older farmers that have larger scale, they was like, you tripping. You need to drop that <laughs> price ASAP. You need like $2 for real. And I was like, all right, bet. Y'all right. Right now, we have $4 a pound. Okay. Which we'll probably, I'm just, we'll probably, I'll probably stick with unless we're able to like scale it up. But um, yeah, $5 it was a big much. But that's what we did. We gave it out to different people. So like everybody could be like connected to it. Because you know, yeah. a lot of sauces like, Mumbo sauce is dope, but like you don't know where mumbo sauce comes from. Right. Every carry has a different mumbo sauce, so it's like yes, different. They do. So it's no standard. And there's like not too many sauces out here really in the streets where you could be like, damn, a dude around my neighborhood or a woman I see every day or this person, that person I really know. But you've also really created a system and one that I feel like anybody can replicate. Certainly. And just think if everyone in our community created a system similar and we replicated it, damn, like how powerful is that? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Like and, what? Yeah. You know, it's so funny. And I do have to wrap up in the next few moments. And although this really doesn't have anything to do with food, I actually listened to another podcast um, about, oh, I can't remember her name. It was a really dynamic podcast about how this woman in Detroit ran like this underground lottery mm. system. And it was all black people. Mm -hmm. And it was like she literally like did the numbers and everything. Mm -hmm. And they gave her the money and she ran the lottery. Mm -hmm. And they somehow formulated numbers. And it was this underground market. And not only did she run an underground lottery system, they also funded other black businesses. Like what? The entire like what? Yeah, that's dope. So if you (laughs) until they got caught, you know, but it's. But I just thought that was so freaking powerful. I mean, she even funded her daughter like through Spellman and everything. But just to hear how the money was used and it was black businesses supporting black business businesses was this underground lottery. So if you take something with the system that you've created and if I did something like that and replicated it and kept the money within our, you know, internal systems. Come yeah, on now. Certainly. Yeah. So that, that's the goal to keep, work with um, as many black farmers as possible. Um, going to hopefully can work with the homies in Baltimore this year. I wanted yeah. to get down to Philly. I know Eugene and Atlanta said he could, he didn't mind growing something for me, but Atlanta's a little bit too far yeah, for yeah. me. But Philly's not that far. No, that's not the um, right. And of course, that, we know folks up there. So just figuring it out mm-hmm. and figuring out how we can scale it and how, you know, like you said, it could be replicated. And, and, and scaled up and, and help, you know, tap into other resources. So we're really building out a sustainable system. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, how, how can we, other people who have value-added products, how can we, you know, market them together? Really kind of replicating a lot of stuff that 
Federation was doing it in their in their like prime days, Boulevard, the mm-hmm. stuff that the visions that Fannie Lou Hamer had, mm-hmm. all of these types of similar kind of cooperatives, really like these cooperative economics, cooperative movements, like working together yes. within the agricultural scene and, and, and you know, um, really not looking at each other as, as competition, but understanding that collectively, exactly. you know, we're powerful. And, and so I think that's the really the wave that a lot of people are looking at. And so I think we're just trying to push it forward. And, uh, you know, see how far I think we can take it very far because there's so many brilliant people, you know, working with Let's the land. Let's take and the it soil, far. So. Let's take it far. Again, Horace Pippen, um, just someone who I definitely want to want to honor through the work that Xavier has been doing. So I'm going to be sharing the series um, of this wonderful collaboration. You're going to see photos of me chatting it up with Xavier. You're going to see photos of Peppers. Um, again, I had a really awesome time. A shout out to Lita, who actually did the photography for those for this series. So I had a wonderful time visiting, like I said, Trina, Kevin Alsep, the Feeding 5000, um, Brittany Drakeford over in Cottage City. Brittany, yeah. um, so we visited all of these wonderful black and brown farmers and gardeners who grew these peppers, and they also spoke to Horace's um, legacy and you know his history and he really does have a dynamic story definitely check out his artwork in DC they even had like a special gallery um, uh, at some point over the past summer that we couldn't get to I remember mm. a friend of mine told me yeah, about it I remember that. yeah so wonderful story I was happy to be a part of it um, where can we find Soyful at on social media and this Pippin Sauce? Yeah, when so, are we going to get uh, this Pippin Sauce Yeah, again? so Soyful mm-hmm. yeah, or IG, Soyful on Facebook, Soyful, Twitter. I'm trying to get my Twitter game up. It's Soyful on Twitter. Um, you can order the Pippin Sauce online if you're locally. In, you can get it at Good Food Market on Rhode Island Avenue. You can, oh, so it's in stores. Yeah, it's in Good Food. Yeah, it's oh, in Good gosh, Food. Oh, gosh. So okay. um, we'll probably, they're, they're I opening up. But, ran completely out. No, no, no. So this year, cool. we, I, I kind of held on. Okay. Some, so I can like stretch it out I until gotcha. we, I didn't want to kind of repeat what I did in eighteen or se- seventeen. <laughs> 17. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can finally definitely can get it directly from me. You can order it online, and we can meet up. I drop it to you if you out of state. I can send it to you. Um, so yeah, it'll probably we're working on some other ways of like distribution with other partners and figuring out how we can get in the CSAs and you know it'll be popping up in in, in a couple different places. Um, coming up soon so I'm excited about it so I appreciate you for having me on your show no thank you for coming I'm just glad we finally made this happen yeah, yeah. yeah I always enjoy my conversations with with Xavier when I say he is the plug he is the plug and I was just telling Alexia right before we broke um, but right before we took our break is that he was really the person behind all of my connections when I first started all of this like you were so thank you so much for connecting me and there's so many more people I need to meet uh, no problem so no many problem. great people um, so and I'm still learning I'm still learning I am I'm not perfect I am still learning in this space and I look forward to learning more uh, yeah we all learn so, <laughs> we for sure learn. all right so before we close out everybody knows we always do our little um, quick question and answer um, Xavier are you ready I got I'm, a few I'm, questions I'm for you yeah okay so what is your favorite leafy green um probably collard greens <laughs> lisa said collard greens too yeah. at lisa in <laughs> collard greens all right shout out to the collard greens sweet spicy sour or salty um sweet okay favorite fruit uh favorite fruit probably like i've been crushing those pink lady apples yes and they're pretty good i like those and it better be a crispy apple yeah. i love me a crispy apple what's cooking in your pot these days um cooking in my pot is it like metaphorical it could be any literal literally L- literally in my pot um uh, or metaphorical if you yeah you yeah for you me choose. metaphorical because i always got some cooking upstairs okay so um south eats that's what's cooking yes south eats South Eats. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say, South Eats. Okay, all right. So that's it. All right. we That's all you get right now, guys. I don't even know what South Eats is yeah. yet, but I'm going to learn. That's what's cooking. Okay, cool. I'm excited about that. That sounds dope. Okay. What is one way someone can channel their inner edible activism? Oh, man. Yeah, definitely. Um, And connecting uh, with your local kind of agrarian, black agrarian or Latino brown agrarian or whatever, Latinx agrarian, somebody of color, connecting with them. You know, if you go to farmer's market, buy their food, uh, you read a book, you read definitely a book. do some education, listen to this podcast. It's a ton of stuff. Um, yes. You know, it's a ton of dope videos, read some articles. I used to read all types of stuff from literally anybody I could read about 
agriculture, and I still do, like, because I want to know what's going on and yeah. stay plugged in. But uh, grow something, get some seeds, you know, uh, grow some, throw some seeds in the ground, and grow something. Mm-hmm. Um, do some history on your family yes. and see, like, you know, what are your ag- 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 agrarian and agricultural roots? Because if you Looking go back far enough, roots. you can find that your great great grandmother. She may have been a, a master herbalist or mm-hmm. something like that, or she may have been a, a doula, a, a doula, or, or birth worker, birth yep. companion, and, and, and knew how to knew. bring babies to you know to from this realm and to, the process you know, and how that. she did it or how yeah, yeah. So, you know, so that I think there's a ton of different ways to be an edible edible activist. That's what's up. That's what's up. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. We're here live on Full Service Radio every Wednesday at 11 a.m. and you can access each episode after it airs on iTunes or Spotify. You can also catch today's show on fullserviceradio.org, which is also home to some really other cool podcasters. So please check them out. Be sure to follow me at Food Talks DC on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Are you an edible activist? Come join me on the show. I would love to feature you. Just shoot me a DM on Instagram. Thanks and have a wonderful day. Peace.